Welcome back. In a few weeks, the Florida legislative session will get underway. And with Republicans firmly in control in Tallahassee, we wanted to get a preview of what the session might look like and discuss just a few of the more controversial issues on the agenda. This week, I spoke to State Representative Daniel Perez, a rising star in the GOP who represents parts of Kendall and Doral. He is in line to become Speaker of the House in 2024. I think this year the legislature's top priority is to make sure that we get businesses uh, going again. Uh, and we'll be doing that by passing some legislation that has to do with uh, protecting businesses from uh, potentially frivolous lawsuits involving COVID. So we're going to give a layer of, of uh, protection from liability uh, when it comes to COVID liability claims. We'll be doing that for the business sector, which in the House is uh, House Bill 7. And then we're also going to be doing that uh, for the health care facilities. So that includes nursing homes, hospitals, um, primary care physicians. Um, and that's going to be a separate bill, which hasn't been rolled out yet. But I would tell you that's probably going to be the biggest priority in the House to make sure that we kind of get our economy going again after the pandemic that, that we're still living in. Um, and the second would be the, the, the budget. The budget's going to be a big issue as well. I want to talk to one of the more controversial uh, items that, that the legislature will be taking up, which I believe is House Bill 1, which is seen as a bill related to um, trying to curb protests. Um, uh, you know, critics say that it's a way to sort of try to limit speech, limit the ability of people to go out and peacefully protest. Uh, how do you view this bill and, and why is this such a high priority? given all the yeah, other problems it, that we've got. It's kind of ironic because they're, they're, they're blaming this bill um, on, on the Republicans trying to limit freedom of speech, and, and that's absolutely just not true. Um, actually, this bill was rolled out um, shortly after January 6th. It was the incidents at, uh, at the Capitol in Washington, D.C., um, which we don't stand for, um, which is uh, wrong, and I'm glad that the Florida House of Representatives is trying to do something to make sure that that doesn't happen in our own backyard. But it was those incidents that actually really um, ignited this bill and the fast movement of this bill through the Florida House. Um, so what we're trying to do is, look, we want people to have the ability to have freedom of speech. Um, we want you to be able to protest. We just want it to be peaceful. Uh, and sometimes what, what we've seen uh, as of late, uh, politics has become very polarizing. And what we're just trying to do is make sure that, you know, let's try not to shatter windows when we're protesting. You know, let's try, let's try not to, 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 to break barricades and, and roam into the Capitol without permission. Let's just do things the right way. And that's what this bill does. Well, I mean, aren't there already laws in place that say that you cannot break windows, that you cannot vandalize, that you cannot ransack a building? I mean, it seems to me that if that's the goal to pass a law to prevent that, that's already there. What this bill seems to do is in order to prevent windows from being shattered, for which there are laws against it, you are trying to prevent people from even gathering to be around windows in the first place. No, not necessarily, Jim. That's absolutely not true. We're, we're, we're not trying to prevent people from gathering. I'll give you a small example of what's happening, and it happened here in Miami, actually. Uh, people were getting arrested for, for doing just that, right, for breaking windows and, and, and being violent on the streets. What was happening is they were getting literally released within a couple hours and getting right back into the ride and doing it all over again. Part of this bill, amongst many different facets of the bill, is to make sure that you are staying overnight if you've been arrested for vandalizing our community. Uh, that, that's not, that was not happening in, in, uh, in these riots that were happening across the country, at least in the state of Florida, it wasn't happening. Um, so How many incidents can you, do there's, you know? There's many parts of the bill. Excuse me? Sure. Do you, do you, just on that point, though, I mean, do you have a list of cases where somebody was, was arrested for some sort of vandalism, went to jail, got out a couple hours later and was rearrested? I mean, how many people are we talking about? Are you talking about hundreds and hundreds of people who you have evidence for, that this took place? Or is this just a few anecdotal incidents? Well, this is, this is an issue across the state, and obviously I represent Miami in the Florida House, so um, I, I can't give you numbers, but, but I, uh, at least in Tampa, in other words, but I can tell you with absolute certainty that that happened in our own backyard in Miami-Dade. I know, you, as you said, there are many elements to this bill. One of the elements, as I understand it, is that, is that uh, this would raise the liability for individual local elected officials, so that, for instance, as it's been explained to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that if the Miami police chief were to go to the Miami City Commission and say, you know, I have some concerns, I'm not sure 
if uh, if we should have a have an, a permit for for this gathering because I can't with 100% certainty guarantee you that there won't be an incident there. But if the city commission goes ahead or the mayor goes ahead and issues a permit for for that gathering, that each member of that city commission would then be personally liable, not not protected by their, their role as a government official, but personally liable for any lawsuits that stem from it. If that's the case, if you create a system like that, why would any local government ever give out a permit for people to be able to protest, peacefully or otherwise? All right. I know, Jim, that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, what, what, what I think you're trying to refer to is what we've set in a process. And just to give you a little bit of a background, the whole purpose of this specific portion of the bill is to make sure um, that those um, commissioners, city, county, municipal, um, that decide to defund the police, that there is a ramification as far as the budget is concerned um, that will take place for that same city county or municipality. We're, we're trying to set standards so that the defunding the police um, idea doesn't take place in our local governments. So we set up these standards where we say, look, if you guys want to, as a city commissioner today, want to defund the police and you want to take away funds from our police department, well, then us as a state, which we obviously fund many parts of our local government, then we are going to hold back those funds because we're not going to have any part in defunding the police on the local level. When it comes to, to the personal responsibility of these city commissioners and being liable for a, a, a protest that goes wrong, no, I, I'm not. I'm not sure that that we're interpreting the bill correctly, um, and, and by by we I mean uh, this conversation because me. I, that's okay. You can say yeah. you're not sure if I'm interpreting the bill correctly. I accept that. Okay. Yeah, but 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 no, no. A city, a city commissioner would, would not be personally liable if there was a peaceful protest that had the right licenses and a bad actor decided to act out of line. But I will tell you this, Jim. Uh, this is a bill that has been very contentious in the Florida House, at least. Um, I'm the chair of the Judiciary Committee, so it's final stop is my committee. Um, we have the first stop uh, performed last week. It was uh, through a subcommittee, through criminal justice. We'll have a second stop in the upcoming week. And then the final stop will be, will be judiciary in the, in the upcoming weeks. And um, if, there, if those issues um, are unclear, uh, that'll be the place that they'll come up. And I'm sure we'll deal with it at the appropriate time. I do want to talk to you about the, the, something you mentioned off the top, which was the liability protection for businesses in, in COVID. I know that this is an area that, that you believe is, is important. Explain to me what, what this legislation would do and why it's needed at this time. Yeah, Jim, what we're trying to accomplish is, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately COVID is a reality today and it's going to be for the near future. Um, and what we're trying to avoid is, uh, you know, uh, if I were to walk into a, a supermarket today and then I go to the movie theater and then I go get a haircut and I go to a restaurant and then I go home and unfortunately I, I, I now have COVID, um, I don't want to be able to turn around and just uh, blankly sue every uh entity that I was a part of. I think we're just going to clog the court systems and, and probably enter some frivolous lawsuits. So what we're doing is we've set some boundaries, which hasn't passed yet, but it's going through the Florida House, um, that the only way a business entity could be liable um, for COVID liability is if uh, they didn't abide by the, the CDC guidelines or the Department of Health guidelines. And by a clear and convincing evidence, which would be the burden of proof, they have been able to be proven as grossly negligent. And Jim, gross negligence is essentially when you purposefully or willfully um, act uh, negligent or, or act against a certain party or entity or individual. And so what we're trying to say is, look, if, if you were irresponsible to the point that you didn't abide by the guidelines, then absolutely you should be held accountable. Um, but we also don't want businesses, especially small businesses who are all, have already taken such a hard hit because of COVID, we don't want them getting hit with tens and tens of lawsuits. And, and I think you just hit on a couple of phrases because I want to I want to just go back. As I understand it, it raises the bar of proof from simple negligence to, as you said, gross negligence and the evidentiary standard from greater weight of the evidence to clear and convincing evidence. My question is, have you raised the bar so high that, that the chances of, of succeeding in a lawsuit against a company that may not have done right uh, is, is impossible then? I don't, I don't think so. That's not what I, what I think the outcome of this bill would, would, would be if it were signed by the governor. Obviously, in due time, we will find out. But no, that's not our goal at all. We still want to hold businesses accountable. We just want to hold the bad actors accountable. I do want to turn to a topic you and I have, uh, have talked a little about earlier, Medicaid expansion. I know this is an issue that keeps coming up, and, and, I, and, I'm, and I don't believe that Florida will expand Medicaid this year 
through their legislative process or, or on behalf of the governor. But I would note that there is a, a recent survey that came out conducted by Tyson Group. 76% of registered voters in the state support a more expansive Medicaid program. Only 13% are against it. In Miami-Dade, you know, that number is even higher. I, I guess philosophically, I know you're opposed to it, but I'm trying, I just want to ask why. If, if, we can, if we can ensure, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of additional people in Florida get them health insurance, with the vast majority of it being paid for by the federal government, why not take advantage of that? Look, Jim, you and I and everyone else, obviously, we always want what's best. You know, if I can make sure that every single person, forget in Florida, in the United States and the world has a roof over their head, then we're going to do that. If we can make sure that everyone has uh, education that's to, to the highest standard that anyone can possibly give, we're, we're going to do that. The unfortunate reality of the world we live in is there's a budget. That's the reality of this world. There's a budget. I'm sure it pulls crazy high. Um, but, but Jim, we, we, don't, we don't govern by polling. The moment we start governing by polling, we're going to lose control of this state. Um, and it, it's the reason why we're, we're getting literally a thousand people a day moving into the state of Florida. It, it's because of the way we govern. Um, and we have a balanced budget. And a part of our budget is health care, as we stated earlier in this conversation. And we have to abide by the, by the dollars that we have in, in, inside of our state. Um, and, and I understand what you're talking about when you're talking about federal, federal dollars that come down and why aren't we drawing the federal dollars? And look, because of COVID, we've expanded Medicaid because of COVID. We, we have a lot more people that have health care coverage under, under, under Medicaid today in the state of Florida because those people needed it. It was necessary. And we as a state had to find a way to make sure that we don't leave anyone out to dry. Um, but when in the deficit year that we're in, in the increased cost on health care that we're at because of the people that we are now covering under Medicaid that we didn't because of COVID, we're just not in the state financially to expect to expand Medicaid right now. Is it short-sighted though? Because, you know, if somebody is not insured, you know, and I realize you have expanded and covered more people because people have lost their jobs and fallen below a certain line. And so therefore are now covered under, under Medicaid where they may not have previously been. But by expanding Medicaid, don't you actually in the long run save money? Because these people still need health care. They, they just end up in our emergency rooms, whether it's Jackson or some other emergency room, you know, and we end up, the state ends up having to pay for them anyway. If someone's uninsured, it's the purpose of our safety net hospitals. And I'm glad you bring up Jackson. It's a perfect example. Every single year uh, through the low income pool, through, through LIP, Jackson receives certain dollars in addition to state funds and federal funds and local funds to where they're able to provide that service to those that are uninsured. There is no one in the state of Florida that can say, I tried to receive medical service and I was denied. It's absolutely just not true. If they were to walk into Jackson, which is a safety net state hospital, we are going to make sure that you have the right treatment. But the problem becomes that when you show up in an emergency room, it's usually because things have progressed to the point where it now is an emergency. Whereas if you're covered under Medicaid, maybe you're getting the preventative care, the type of care that you need that would prevent you from having emergency care, which is all that much more expensive. I think that's the argument in support of it is that if you have health insurance, you're seeing a doctor in advance. You're you're catching these things before they develop into a, a medical crisis for the individual. Yeah, Jim, you're right. And, and that's why we provide Medicaid. That's why we uh, work with the federal government to provide Medicare. It's why we have private health care insurers. Um, so, so, yes, I, I agree with you. And for those that qualify for Medicaid, they get that. And for those that um, are, are fortunate enough to, to, um, uh, to afford a private health care insurer, that's the service that they get. Um, but, and the folks in between, the folks in between those who currently get Medicaid and those who have insurance, that gap right there, what happens to them? It depends on, the, on that person's circumstance. I, I, this, is not, this is not about just making sure that if you fall within a certain gap or you don't. He, he, here with this, here's, here's the way that I would look at this, Jim. We have a standard for Medicaid, and it has to do on a variety of uh, facts about your life, about your income, are you married, do you have children? If you fall within uh, those, those brackets, then you are provided a service, which is the Medicaid service, because we understand that you cannot afford to go out there and get a private health care insurer. What we're saying in the state is if you don't fall within that bracket, then it is our, it is our belief that you are able to afford a private health care insurer.